Hello, it's Land Gotti, founder of Food Secure Future, a place for people of all ages and backgrounds to share ideas and learn about the most pressing food security issues. I'm here today with a special guest, Dr. Benjamin Goldstein, who has too many accomplishments to list, but to name a few. He received a PhD in management engineering from the Technical University of Denmark. He's the head of the Sustainable Urban Rural Futures Lab, which studies and emphasizes urban sustainability at multiple scales. Dr. Goldstein is a world-renowned expert in urban agriculture with multiple impactful publications. Hello, Dr. Goldstein. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks, Landon, and um, thanks for the introduction. I, I don't think anyone else has described me in such nice terms, but I'll take it. <laughs> it's well-deserved. <laughs> so today I'd like to discuss the impact of urban gardens on food insecurity. So mm -hmm. with that being said, my first question for you today is, how do urban gardens contribute to sustainability efforts in cities? And what specific environmental benefits have you observed through your research? Too many things to name and list. There's so much that urban gardens and farms and community spaces in and around cities do to make city and urban food systems more sustainable. So I'll list off a couple that I've specifically noticed in, in my research. Um, one is uh, the ability for these farms to interact with the waste systems in the cities in which they're, they're situated. So they can often take in uh, food waste or food scraps from local communities and use that as compost that they can then use as um, fertilizer on their, on their farms. And that basically allows them to avoid having to get fertilizer and nutrients from uh, synthetic sources, which is a large driver of greenhouse gas emissions and also um, a, a reason that we are running out of certain types of um, minerals across the planet, actually, like phosphorus in particular, um, is something that we keep mining and we don't have a sustainable um, source for it long term. So if we can recirculate these things within the, the food system, then that's great. A second thing that I've noticed is that um, by people learning about where their food comes from, the people that actually interact with um, urban gardens, they can actually change their diets because I think they get a new perspective on how much goes into actually growing food and producing food. And they change their diets often in good ways. There's been some studies, not mine, that have shown that when people engage in urban, urban f gardening and urban farming, they actually consume less meat. And that can actually have a very good impact um, on the climate and on the land systems of our planet because meat is very environmentally intensive to produce. So if we can reduce that by changing behaviors, then that's an amazing thing. So those are just two things I, that have been documented in the literature and that I've noticed firsthand when uh, visiting these types of sites. Yeah, it's pretty amazing how you mentioned only two, but still, those are really big impacts this can have on our communities. So my next question is, what role do urban gardens play in addressing food security issues, particular, particularly in underserved communities? Yeah, that's another aspect of sustainability. So I was talking about the environmental component of it before, but now we're thinking about social sustainability. Um, and sadly, there's many people that still go hungry, even in a rich country like the United States. There's too much, there's more than enough food produced, but it's not always getting to the, to the people that need it. And um, I think urban agriculture has a well-documented role in filling those types of gaps within cities um, where people do not have access to fresh fruits and vegetables or do not have, ac have money to purchase food necessarily all the time. I think that urban farming and urban gardens can play an important role filling those types of gaps, either by um, making food available at reduced prices, um, making food available that wouldn't have been available in the first place in those neighborhoods because there weren't any grocery stores or farmers markets selling fresh produce, or thirdly, by just simply giving away and donating food. I've seen more than a couple projects where I visited and they, they just harvest the food um, with volunteers and then they actually just make it freely available to the community and then the community can come in and take whatever they want you know they can donate if they'd like but it's pay what you can and that's pretty powerful um, especially in low-income neighborhoods and communities um, in cities so it can play a very big role um, and, and it also has a multiplying effect once people see one urban farm there seems to be a uh, 
some sort of contagion effect that goes along with it. So people see it and then they decide, hey, I can also start an urban farm or I can start gardening in my backyard. And so it, it has this sort of knock on effect. So even though it, you might only see one urban farm and it might feel like it's an isolated you know, anomaly in a neighborhood, it can still have a big um, influence on the neighbors and also just by being the first seed that plants and causes urban farming to spread within that neighborhood. Yeah. So just the knowledge or knowing about it really causes an impact too, which is pretty amazing. Have you seen yeah. any... I, I'm, I'll just add, they've seen this with all types of other sustainability technologies and unsustainable technologies. Like people see their friends get a Hummer and then they feel like they need one. But you can also see similar effects with um, solar panels, for instance. So if you know there's a first mover in your neighborhood that happens to get one, then it's often the case that you'll see it proliferate throughout the neighborhood um so urban agriculture can work in a similar way yeah it's a good contagion like you said before mm -hmm. have you seen it impacting uh communities in any way um in terms of culturally appropriate food yeah you know what i remember working with a farm in boston during my phd and we saw that they were growing a lot of vegetables and fruits that these farmers um, being first generation immigrants uh, were not able to find in Boston in the markets anymore. So it was it was fruits and vegetables from their home countries that they saw that either held important significance to them for a cultural reason or for a nutritional reason. And they they actually would grow it um, on their own because they couldn't find it in the market. Set. So I think that's one of the main things I've seen actually with urban farms is great diversity of, of vegetables and fruits are, are produced there exactly because people want to grow stuff that is sensitive to their culture. So uh, we just did this project in Europe where we had about 80 different farms on board and we analyzed all of the different crops that they grew. And we had like a list of well over 300 crops that were being grown across all of these different farms. Um, and if you compare that to, you know, larger industrial agriculture where they only grow one crop on a very big piece of land, um, it's a very different story. Um, so the, these farms actually add in biodiversity as well to cities if we want to think about additional environmental and, and, and ecosystem benefits of these spaces. Yeah, it's great. So we'll talk about a couple of positives. Uh, can you discuss some challenges or barriers that urban gardening initiatives face in terms of scalability and long-term sustainability? Oh, they're always um, against, you know, fighting against pressure to have land developed towards more economically, I guess people would say profitable uses. I would argue that we're, you know, um, the way we define profit is important. So if we're thinking about profit towards investors, yeah, it's probably more profitable to put up an apartment building in cities like that too, because then they can get more tax revenue. But is that more profitable necessarily for the community always? That's a different and broader discussion that we need to have. Um, but often um, the land that urban farms and gardens is on is either donated or it's um, given to the farmers um, because the, the city has nothing else to do with it, more or less, at the time, but it's given with an understanding that they might have to move in the future. And so land tenure is often um, pretty unstable for these types of spaces. So they might be operating for one, two, three, five, ten years, and then they find out, oh, hey, the city actually wants to develop this land or sell it or do something with it. Or the person that abandoned the land has come back because now the neighborhood is gentrifying and they want to sell it again um, and, and, and turn a profit on that. So land tenure is a huge um, barrier to long term sustainability of these and the scalability of these things. Um, so, I mean, a city like Detroit, not too far from where I am, the land use pressure is not nearly as high. So. Um, there's plenty of land. It's a sh it has been a shrinking city for a long time. Uh, and so there's often an idea that there's plenty of agricultural space there. Um, but a place like New York or a place like Boston, um, where land use and development pressure is a lot higher, 
it's a different story altogether. And, and there's a long history of, of farmers being uprooted and kicked off of land um, when the city or the private developers want to do something with it. And there's lots of literature around that. So finding ways to secure land tenure um, would, would go a long way towards ensuring the sustainability. I think another thing to think about is that if we're thinking about environmental sustainability, um, one thing that I've studied is the, the carbon impacts and climate emissions of urban agriculture. And um, I know that's only one piece of what urban agriculture does. It's not so, you know, it, the people practice urban agriculture for different reasons. Some people do it because they want to do it for an educational purpose, or some people want to have food sovereignty. All of these are very, um, are all justified and, and defensible reasons for doing this. I mean, I, I'm not going to tell someone why or why not to do urban agriculture. Um, but sometimes urban agriculture um, gets this, has, it gets the, um, it gets, it gets classified as being automatically like climate friendly agriculture. Mm. And it can be, but that's not always the case. So I think that's something we also need to, to try and be sensitive to as we're trying to combat climate change and thinking of urban agriculture and localizing food systems as an integrative solution to that. Um, we should be judiciously choosing the crops that we're growing and thinking about the ways that we grow those crops so that we can also make sure that it contributes to um, reducing climate change impacts from cities. Uh, so I guess the long and the short of it is, is just because you're growing the food close to where it's being consumed doesn't net make it a magical climate solution because often it's, you know, the, the carbon emissions from food transport are very small compared to the actual emissions of producing the food. So just because you get rid of those doesn't mean you've made a huge difference actually in the overall food system. Um, so if, again, big if, if you know an urban farming project is advertising and saying it wants to help fight climate change directly through their farming activities, then you know there has to be care taken into what they grow and how they do it. But it can and it should, and I think it it, it will play a vital role in that types of uh, transition to low carbon urban food systems. Yeah, I like how you highlight that. Even though there's all these amazing things, there's still room for improvement. It's not foolproof by any means, but it's a great plan, great system, and we can keep working towards making it better. And and I'd like to say, like, the onus is not on the urban farms to reduce the carbon emissions of our global food system. I mean, it's industrial agriculture and these massive um, agri-food companies and corporations that are really the ones who are doing the damage. And, and so, I mean, really the pressure should be on them. And I, and I do put in my own research, I try to highlight that, but um, just thinking holistically, like every actor should be doing the best that they can, but by all means, you know, the urban farmers are not, you know, the bad actors in this situation. Just want to make that clear. Yeah, of course. So my final question for you today is, in your opinion, how can urban gardens be better integrated into city planning and policy to enhance their role in creating more sustainable urban environments? Yeah, I don't know if I'm necessarily like the policy person to ask about that. Um, but again, thinking about coming back to that land tenure question, like making sure that gardeners and farmers are integrated into com conversations about long-term land use planning within cities and not just thinking about them as short-term gaps and how to use land until it becomes profitable to do something else. And so integrating them into really strategic plans about how the city wants to develop um, that are developed by the communities and the, and the municipal governments themselves um, that that take into account all of those stakeholders and, and give urban farmers, amplify their voices so that they can be integrated into, into these types of um, decisions that happen at the municipal level so that they do have land tenure. Um, and so thinking about urban agriculture as a blue green infrastructure solution to all types of problems that that it's not just about producing food but it's also about rainwater capture it's also about providing space for pollinators it's also about increasing biodiversity about providing green space for residents so when 
um, the city wants to talk about doing any one of these things, like you know, having more rainwater and stormwater capture so that it can be diverted away from, from aging, overloaded sewer infrastructure, for instance, then urban agriculture practitioners could be involved in that conversation with the city to emphasize how it's not just about food, but it's also about doing all these other things and having these co-benefits, um, which would hopefully, I think, make it more attractive in, as a long-term land use. Or for instance, a lot of cities are becoming climate resilient or, or making inroads by ensuring that new buildings have to have green roofs on top of them. Um, maybe cities could also, instead of just setting the low bar at green roofs, think more about how can we have these be integrated food production spaces on rooftops and give access to communities to actually do and build those things. I think um, there's lots of things we can do to integrate urban, um, urban agricultural practitioners into um, policy discussions about how to, to enhance their role in sustainable urban governance. Yeah. I mean, sounds great. I'm looking forward to the future of it, going through New York City and maybe seeing a garden or two. They're there, right? They're all over. There's yeah, I have seen hundreds of gardens, right? Yeah. Do you do you do you do um do you volunteer? Do you check out any of these places? Have you been to any, you know, urban gardens in and around New York? Not in the city, but uh, I'm a big gardener. I do have a garden in Bayshore and all the produce, uh, we donate that. So yeah, that's my, I guess my closest thing to that, but yeah. All right. Nice. Well, that's all for me. Is there anything else you'd like to add? No, not at all. It was just nice chatting. Um, I guess I have a question for you. Will you continue doing urban agriculture into the future? What do you get out of doing urban agriculture? That's my question. What do I get out of uh, doing urban agriculture? I think what I get out of it is sort of this fulfillment for really helping others and, you know, giving everyone access to the same thing that I really have access to. I'm pretty lucky, I have to say. So uh, being able to do that, I think that's really important and it's fair, you know, it makes me feel good as well. So that's the main test. That's the main test. If it, if it gives you a bad feeling in your stomach after doing it, then it's called morality. <laughs> Anyways, thanks a lot for chatting and inviting me to, to talk. And that's a great answer. I think that's the reason we should do most things. Yeah. All right. Thank you for coming on again. Yeah, no worries.